And uh, no pressure for Steve that Dr. Colin is uh, staying to listen to it. Uh, Steve, it's over to you. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. What a fantastic talk by Dr. Colin Forsyth, the professional view of space weather. Now we get the amateur view. I mean, Colin said that in the event of a very bad space weather event, the world could end, basically. The banking system would collapse. There would be no food, no transport. But would 20 meters be open? That's what we need to know. <laughs> so I'm going to look at where we are in the sunspot cycle. We're going to look at HF propagation throughout that sunspot minimum that we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to look at some tools that you can use and some hints and tips, really, for what we can be doing over the next few years. So first of all, where are we in the current sunspot cycle? Um, and as you can see, we are roughly here. And the indication is, um, by sunspot number, that sunspot minimum is 2019, 2020. Very, very hard to actually say when exactly sunspot minimum is. It's something you spot after the event, really. But I, somebody said to me the other day, well, surely we are at sunspot minimum. No, we're not. We've got a lot more to go yet. So that's looking at sunspot, uh, sunspot minimum in terms of the sunspot number. If we look at the um, solar flux index, the 10.7 centimetre uh, solar flux index as well, again, we see that we're heading back towards 2019-2020 um, again. Last year, I said there was strong correlation between the sunspot number and the solar flux index. I should have included the word, word smoothed in that, smooth sunspot number and the solar flux index. And if we actually overlay those two graphs of the smooth sunspot number and the solar flux index, you can see there is, there is a very good correlation between the two. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we, use, we tend to use the smooth sunspot number with our propagation prediction programs. The day-to-day day variability of the solar flux index is one thing, but when we are producing propagation predictions, we tend to look for monthly means, monthly medians, um, and that's why we use the smooth sunspot number rather than that day-to-day -day variation. We had a very good example of that over the last kind of month or so when the solar flux index shot up dramatically at one point, but it wasn't necessarily reflected in our propagation at that particular time, because there's so many other things going on. We've got the geomagnetic effects as well. But that was just to show that, yes, for those of you who think we're at sunspot minimum and really think that we're about to start seeing an improvement in sunspot numbers, no. It's uh, going to get a little bit worse. This is another chart from uh, Belgium, the Royal Observatory of Belgium, again with their predictions of sunspot minimum. And again, we're looking at 2019-2020, which then puts sunspot maximum, the next one, at about 2026 or thereabouts. So um, come and see me in, what, nine, ten years' time and see whether we're right or not. Okay, can we expect a poor cycle 25? That's another question that has come up. Um, every, I, I love this kind of time. Um, every time we, we are kind of heading towards sunspot minimum, all the scientists come out with, you know, what's the next sunspot cycle going to be like? And as you can see, we've got d uh, data going back to 1700 there. And if you can see a particular pattern on trying to predict whether we're going to have a good or a bad sunspot cycle, um, please let me know. You can see from these last four peaks that um, it does appear that perhaps our next cycle won't be quite as good as some of the earlier ones. The, the, the big one, the one that everyone remembers as a radio amateur, is here, of course. Um, 2001 was very, very good. That's when 10 metres was open to America just about every day um, in the autumn, and I got fed up with working in Americans on 10 metres. Um, but the indication is that maybe the next cycle will be similar to the one we've just had. Um, the other evidence is that the magnetic um, field strengths of the sunspots that we've been seeing is weakening. And so we've got a, this great comment at the top there that suggests we're not entering a grand solar minimum, but we are seeing a continuation of the decline of those uh, mean magnetic fields. Or my good friend Carl K9LA puts it better as we have some evidence we're entering an extended solar minimum, we have some evidence that we're not. I think that sums it up quite well. <laughs> I, yeah, I told him I was going to use this, he didn't mind, but I thought, I thought that said it all really. Um, but there is good news. There is good news. The first sunspot of Solar Cycle 25 has been spotted. So a big cheer for that one. There we go. Lovely. Um, this was in December 2016, and there it is. 
Um, how do we know it's from uh, cycle 25? It has a, a different um, magnetic polarity to the others, and it's occurring at a fairly high latitude. Um, so it's definitely the first one. As far as I know, there's not been another one spotted since then. Colin's shaking his head as well. That's good. So for those of you who thought, brilliant, excellent, sunspot 25, sunspot cycle 25 is starting, everything's going to get great again. No. It's very, uh, very common for the first sunspot cycle. Uh, of a cycle to be seen for many, many years before actually anything gets going. And I was going to include a visible light image of this sunspot, but when I actually looked at the visible light image, you could actually see it. So it's pretty pointless putting up. Just to cheer you up, that's what the sunspot looks like um, at sunspot maximum. Um, this was the last maximum in 2015 with a solar flux index of 165, sunspot number of 181. Quick comment here. When you read that the sunspot number is 15, 25, or whatever, that does not mean there's 25 sunspots. The way it works is you have uh, 10 for a group and one for a sunspot. So one sunspot on the sun is a sunspot number of 11, one for a group and one for uh, the sunspot in it. I know there's some confusion sometimes that people think there's 181 sunspots, and they start counting them and go, no, that doesn't seem to work. But that's the way the, uh, the sunspot uh, number is uh, listed. Now, we've got another problem that's been causing me big grief and everyone else some, uh, big grief over the last few months, and that is coronal holes. These are areas of the sun with open magnetic field, which is allowing the um, plasma to escape more easily. And it's a little bit like um, a garden sprinkler that's spraying this damn stuff out. And this is what's been causing most of the disruption that we've had on the amateur bands recently. And in fact, if you look at the K index for today in the last few days, it's been very, very disturbed. That's due to coronal holes. And if you look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet, this is something that Colin was talking about earlier, um, you actually see these as dark patches. I've highlighted it so you can see what it looks like. So the sun at the minute on the left, that's what it looked like this morning, nothing to see. Look at it in extreme ultraviolet, and um, we see these dark coronal holes. The sun is rotating that way, so this is moving from left to right. And so we can actually try and work out whether this is going to impact the Earth. And it was this area here that's been causing the disruption. Usually that plasma hits us in about two days. So when I do the GB2RS forecast on Thursday for the following week, usually I'm looking at images like this, trying to work out as the thing is rotating, um, whether we're going to get hit by this stuff. And as you showed one of the models, um, we, we get some good ideas on whether this is going to happen or not. This is actually um, this morning, and you can see that this area 34 is the one that's been causing us big problems. Then it goes quiet a little bit, and then we get the tail end of this area coming around. So the best guess at the moment is that things will start to quieten down maybe for a couple of days, and then we're going to get hit again by plasma from this area here. And then we've got this one just waiting for you as well. Um, getting the forecast propagation forecast every week absolutely right is really, really hard. Got it right this week. Um, I actually said that uh, if you want to do your DX, do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then things will get poor. Um, actually, spot on. Who works from DX on 10 meters on Thursday this week? Who did, where did you work? Uh, into South America. You got into South America. I worked Saudi Arabia. Someone else worked um, the States, I think, and someone else worked VK9. We think that was an enhancement due to it's plasma. Well. Yeah, this was an enhancement due to plasma from um, this region 34. Someone said it was um, sporadic E. It certainly wasn't, but it was a, um, an F layer enhancement. It's very, very hard to say whether you're going to get these or not. This is something that, as radio amateurs, we'd really like to know. Because on the whole, high K indices, not good for us at all. But in that instance, they were these, sh these short-lived enhancements that were caused by the, this, this incoming plasma. Then, ultimately, what happens is maximum usable frequencies decline. You see it in the, um, well, you see it here on the bands. And then you've got this disturbed period for about two or three days till it all clears up. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week, we'd had three or four days of very low K indices, very settled bands, and it was quite good. Um, so this is what we try and predict every week. Um, the other thing is coronal holes. We know that um, looking at the data right now, it's affecting us, but we look at some of the, the problems that we occurred in uh, kind of 2008, 2009 around that solar minimum, 
And I was going to try and get some images from the SDO spacecraft. It wasn't launched until 2010, but using the SDO, so the SOHO spacecraft, yes, we can see from those images there that, yes, there were coronal holes. So this rather suggests that the coronal hole effects that we're seeing, which are actually kind of detrimental to what we're trying to do as radio amateurs, are likely to continue into solar minimum. So we're going to get problems 2018, probably 2019, before we see the upturn, um, which is a bit of a problem. I think coronal holes were something that we, on the whole, we ignored when we were looking at uh, propagation, uh, radio uh, propagation as, as amateurs, but there's something we've actually got to pay more attention to because that's likely to impact us more than anything else. There won't really be many sunspots in that period up to solar minimum, if any at all, but these coronal hole effects may continue, so we've got to watch those. So we need to start looking at trying to predict um, if we get any enhancements for when this plasma first hits and then trying to predict whether the, we're going to get de um, depleted or decreased MUFs as we go into it. So we really shouldn't ignore coronal holes. Other tools we've got, this is something um, that we've worked on or Jim Bacon has worked on which plots the critical frequency from either Fairford or Chilton in real time and then overlays it with um, prediction predictions for maximum usable frequencies over different path lengths. So from this we can see that the FOF2 or critical frequency was below 5 megahertz here but it was suggesting that over these different path lengths this is the kind of maximum usable frequencies we're going to get. This is currently on a site um, called Convective Weather. It's going to be moving very very soon to a site called propquest.co.uk now, all of these URLs and whatever I'm mentioning today are actually on my um, website. So if you Google G0KYA, all the details are on there, and that will give you the links you need to use this. But this is a tool that Jim's been developing that takes the Chilton data, plots it in real time, and also plots the predictions in terms of distances. And you can see all sorts of effects of these. We can see, not here, but we can see sporadic E effects. We can see the effects of... Um, uh, solar flares. You were suggesting that solar flares are good. We hate them. We hate them. What we also get is we get very, very uh, high D layer absorption due to solar flares. So you actually see the, 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 the bands just die. Um, you get these Dellinger fade outs, so they, they can disappear for like two hours. So we don't actually like solar flares that much um, because the, it just knocks out the bands. But yeah, I mean, a few weeks ago we had a really bad solar flare. You could see the effects on the Chilton ionogram because it just, just vanished for about um, an hour, I think. So again, these are some of the tools that uh, we've got. Some issues with Chilton at the moment, I mean, the, the data feed from that was, had gone off this morning, um, and we get this a lot. So we're looking at including Fairford, Chilton, and Dorb in France as well, so that it will always be something you actually use. And on the site, you can actually look at an archive of data and go back to that as well. So rather than switch the radio on, you could just go to this and work out what you're likely to hear and what you're not. Um, and it showed that due to this high K index that we've had over the last four or five days, maximum usable frequencies over 3,000 kilometers are really not going much above 14 megs, where about a week ago they were up to 24 megs. So you don't even need to switch the radio on to work out whether um, conditions are good or bad. Just turn your computer on and have a look. Um, this again is what I was showing you in terms of the um, AP, uh, the A index progression through time. And this is the period of solar minimum that we had in 2008, 2009. And you can see that we were still getting geomagnetic disturbances right the way through down to that minimum. And I think this, as I showed with the um, SOHO imagery, was coronal holes. So again, this, the, the issue with coronal holes, as I said, is going to continue. So we really need to get a grip on that and really understand that to know when we are likely to get quieter conditions, when the bands are better or more disturbed conditions. But they're certainly not going to, this is not solar flares or CMEs that's causing this over this period of time. I keep looking at Con, see if he nods. If he starts doing that, I know I'm talking rubbish. Please don't. Yeah, right, okay. Um, and again, if we look at the number of days with a geomagnetic storm per year, that period of solar minimum, again, you can see that those two years, which were kind of solar minimum, we had an extended solar minimum, we were still getting disturbed conditions again in 2008, which again just says to me that 2018 is not going to be terribly um, good in terms of geomagnetic, geomagnetic storms caused by the coronal holes, and it may be right the way through into 2020 before we start seeing much of an improvement. Now, HF propagation, this is what you guys want to know. What I've done here is used a program called W6ELProp, 
which is showing its age, but is actually still a very, very good program. It's a PC-based program to actually show you the sort of uh, maximum usable frequencies you can expect on various paths. And what I've done here is from my QTH to New York City um, for two different solar flux index figures. 66, which is probably about as low as it go is going to go. At some spot minimum, it really doesn't drop below 65, 66. So I've run some figures with 66. This is what we're going to get, sunspot minimum. And then run some figures at 275, which is what we had as a sun sunspot maximum in 2001. And as you can see, if we were at sunspot maximum, then you would find that you could work New York City on 10 meters right the way from 2 o'clock through to about uh, half past 6. The good old days. Who remembers those? Go on. There we go. Excellent. Fantastic. No, we have got to get those. 2019... 2018, 2019, it shows you that if you want to work that same path now, you're going to be looking at using 20 metres, and if you're really lucky, 17 metres. Um, but those fantastic openings on 10 metres across the Atlantic, we're probably not going to get it. This is a game of probabilities, by the way. We're not saying there won't be any 10 metre openings across the Atlantic. We're saying there'll be a very low probability. There might be one a month, but it might be short-lived and be very hard to actually um, predict. Let's have a look at another path then. Let's have a look at a north-south path into South Africa. So again, for my QTH to South Africa, sunspot maximum, the good old days, look at this. Maximum usable frequency exceeds 40 uh, megahertz. So you could work right down into South Africa all around the lunchtime period. Fantastic. Are we going to get that? Well, no, but you may find you get some 10-meter openings down into South Africa, even at sunspot minimum. And definitely maybe 15 and 12 metres might still be open on that path in 2019. And you can play with these computer programmes and, and get some idea of the sorts of things you can expect. One more path. So um, UK to Brazil. Again, look at this. Sunspot maximum, solar flux index 275. Very easily open on 10 metres and perhaps a little bit higher. These are when you started to get these six metre openings that are coming in as well. But no, we're not going to get that. You're going to be looking at 15 metres, maybe 12 metres if you're lucky, with the odd occasional 10 metre opening on the north-south path to um, Brazil. It's all a bit doom and gloom, really, isn't it? OK. Now, what does that look like in terms of global propagation? This is using VOACAP online, free program that you can use. What I've done is taken October, which usually is a, a good month for uh, DXing for amateurs, um, fed in a sunspot, smooth sunspot number of zero, which is what we're going to be seeing, kind of 2019, uh, early 2020, and not terribly good, really. Um, on 50 metres, you had should have pretty good uh, propagation into northern Africa and maybe southern Europe. Everywhere else is going to be a little bit patchy. Just to um, depress you even more, that's what it looks like, solar maximum. So those of you who, who's just got their license in the last two years? No, no. Oh, oh, lady at the back, fantastic. You'll have to wait a while, I'm afraid. You know, to get the good stuff, you're going to have to wait a while. Other than sporadic E in the summer. I mean, yes, sporadic E will continue um, in the summer period from May to September on the higher bands. Well, actually, we say the higher bands. You see sporadic E effects from 40 metres upwards, really. Um, so roll on sporadic E next summer if we want to see some activity on 10 metres reliably. There's another one. That's what it looks like on 10 metres with a smooth sunspot number of zero in October. Not terribly exciting, really. But again, sunspot maximum, it looks more like that. Um, again, so VOACAP, VOACAP online, free program that you can use to try and look at some of the uh, paths that are open and help you actually decide the best times of day to actually, and best times of year to actually work some of these paths. Um, something else that Carl K9LA has been talking about recently is that when we have solar minimum, we have a weaker solar magnetic field, weaker interpl interplanetary magnetic field, more galactic cosmic rays are able to get into the Earth's atmosphere. These can cause um, absorption of the D layer down at the, uh, the right, right at the bottom. So more ionization of the D layer and greater absorption of 160 meter, 1.8 megahertz signals. So the classic rule that some people say is that, yes, the lower bands are better at sunspot minimum. That may not necessarily be the case for 160 meters. So even more depressing news, I'm afraid. Just give up and go and 
collect stamps or something, you know, it's up to you. Okay, I'm just going to look for um, a, a couple of programs, PC programs that you can use. This is not an exhaustive list at all, but if you're fairly new to the hobby, uh, VOA Prop, written by the late Julian Moss, is still available. Excellent little PC program that is nice just to run up a corner and get an idea of what's open to where and when. And the great thing is that you've got a little slider so if you're a newly licensed running 10 watts for a compromise antenna, you can set it at low. If you're running 10 kilowatts for an 18 element yard, get 300 feet, or a CDXC member, um, you, put it, you put it at high. So not a bad little program at all, and it works um, with the VOA cap. You have to install the VOA cap engine, and this is a front end for it, so it's pretty good. The ham cap is another one that's available free. Again, it uses the VOA cap engine. You get to specify what sort of antenna you've got. You tell it what the smooth sunspot number is. Lo and behold, you get some of these graphs. Again, totally free. Again, there are other programs. I'm an ACHF you can buy, uh, but that's about $100, I think. But these are, are two of the kind of the simpler, easier ones to use and uh, come recommended. If you don't want or don't have a PC or don't want to run a PC, you can go online now and use some of the tools there. VOACAP Online is an excellent tool. Um, again, just go online, say where you are, where you want to work, and it will come up with a path of uh, a, a plot of what bands you should be on and when. And it's also able to do these marvelous rosettes, which is for point-to-point -point communication. You can see that you go for the hotter spot. So if we were trying to work New York, I think, on this, on, what is it, on, do, 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 there we go, 20 meters at that time would be optimum. And as you mouse over this, it will tell you the, the probability of you being able to work that um, area at that time. So again, totally free, VOA cap online. Again, G0KYA, just Google that, and there's a, I put a, a post up with the links to all of these programs. PredTest um, has been released over the last two years. This is Gwyn of the Propagation Study Committee, Gwyn G4FKH. There's a program called ITURHF Prop, which is the European equivalent of VOACAP, if you like. It's a propagation prediction program that had very um, tabular output, numerical output. And I said, wouldn't it be nice if we could take that output and do what VOACAP has done with it and actually have graphical um, output instead? And he found some programmers to work on it, and it's now available. The URL is predtest.uk. Whether eventually we'll merge this with something else, I don't know. Um, it's not on the RSGB server for a very good reason. Um, it's easier for us to actually just run it separately from RSGB and uh, don't have to get into the, the politics of running other people's software on, uh, yeah, on the, the RSGB server. But again, it's free. You can do point to point. You can do area. Um, works very, very well. And this, again, is a, an area coverage map that PredTest has um, um, produced using a smooth sunspot number of 18 for this month. And you can see that on 20 meters, that's the kind of um, program, uh, sorry, area that we can um, get. PropQuest, um, I think I mentioned this earlier. This is the, the tool that um, Jim Bacon has been developing. And this was a, a, a plot for when was this? This was um, October. And you can see, as I said, that a couple of weeks ago, we were seeing these openings on 12 meters, but today it's down here. So it's a very, very quick tool to see you know, what's, what's been happening and when. Um, we use this a lot. We use it for working out if we're going to do um, club contests, club championship things. How long is 3.5 megs going to be open around the UK? We use it for a sporadic E. You can spot um, solar flares on this because there's usually a big gap. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before I let you run off and win your prizes is FT8 propagation. Um, this, obviously, FT8 is new mode. It's not been around terribly long yet. And a lot of people have been saying that, well, okay, but I'm able to work over distances that programs say I shouldn't be able to work, the band should be closed. How many people here use FTA? And are you, you working some good stuff with it? Okay, well, we've been looking at this and thinking, well, is that the case? Is it that we're working beyond, beyond the maximum usable frequency on paths? Or is it that we just need to tweak the tools we've got um, to make it work better? For example, this is an example of New York to Norwich 
where I live um, for, again, October, using a smooth sunspot number of 21. And you can see that it's suggesting that using the signal-to-noise ratio that VOACAP recommends um, of 31 dB, that's what we get. So in other words, really, that path shouldn't be open more than about kind of 1 to 20% of the time at certain times of the day. Now, VOACAP recommends a, a signal-to-noise ratio of 31 dB as the kind of signal-to-noise ratio you want for a good contact on CW. But if you start reading between the lines, you should be able to have a CW contact way, way lower than that, down to maybe 0 dB or maybe up to 5 dB. So if we actually plot that, whoops, wrong one, go back, at um, 0 dB signal-to-noise ratio, we, we can actually start to see that, in fact, we've now got a 50 to 80% chance of working or hearing New York at that time. So it's a case of adjusting the signal-to-noise ratio to actually reflect what you're trying to do within VARACAP. Um, and for, ex for example, if you start listening to the beacon network on 14.1 um, um, and then 15 meters and 10 meters as well, you actually start to see that you can actually hear the, the um, beacon that's in New York on, t on 15 meters, 21 megs. And this is suggesting that maybe 50 to 80 percent of the time you should be able to hear it. So let's extend that a little bit more then. So what happens if we, we change the signal to noise ratio from 0 dB to minus 20? And now we start to see that, yes, there is a, a fleeting chance now up here that you could work New York on 12 meters between those hours. Probably, you know, maybe 20 to 40 percent of the time. So in other words, what I'm saying, and this is not definitive, but if you're trying to work out what you can work on FT8 around the world, use VOACAP, play with the required signal-to-noise ratio, reduce it down to something like minus 20 dB, and you should suddenly start to see that these things are possible. The theory behind FT8 propagation really is that we need to kind of redefine what we mean by back maximum usable frequency. We usually say the maximum usable frequency is that frequency that will support a solid contact between A and B. But there are patches of ionization along that path that are going to be refracting and reflecting some of that RF, but not much of it. But because FT8 works at much, much lower signal-to-noise ratios, that's enough to make a contact. So by adjusting this SNR, we start to get a better idea within VOACAP of what FT8 can actually do. Um, so again, I may come and speak to you next year and suggest, so don't use minus 20, use something else. But at least play with it, and you start to see that this is not magic. It's not a magic mode that's discovering a propagation we never knew before. It's just that it's showing that if we look below the noise, there is some probability that um, you can work these paths on FT8. Steve, some of those programs that you mentioned a minute ago, you can just change your power level, can't you? You can do effectively increase the sensitivity of the... Uh, the you, you can. I mean, the thing about HamCap, VoaCap, and the rest is they're quite simplistic. VoaCap... Uh, you can control so many different parameters. In fact, you can screw it up because you don't know what you're doing. And there's a really good document on VOACAP that says the top 10 uh, mistakes when using VOACAP. And it's worth reading that stuff. But you're absolutely right. In fact, some of the first um, predictions I did for FT8 like this, I'd left it at 500 kilowatts by mistake. <laughs> so not CDXC, but yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so just to come back to where we started, really, this is the K index over the last few days. I, I put this on at 1 o'clock, what is the date today? Is it the 13th today? No, it was Friday, wasn't it? Um, so we've got the 15th, that's today. So we've got from uh, 3 a.m., 6 a.m., 9 a.m., midday. And you can see that things are improving, but we're not out of the, the woods yet. I think the prediction really is that over the next couple of days, that will come down a little bit further. We may start to see twos and threes, and it's likely to go up again due to the, the coronal hole effects. But... Keep an eye on this. In terms of working out propagation at the moment, pay less attention to the solar flux index and the sunspot number, but pay more attention to what's happening geomagnetically um, with the Earth. And this is going to become even more important over the next two years. And you'll find on the whole that on HFDX, you want low K indices. You want them in the ones and the twos over a period of a few days to get better conditions. But if you start to see that, 
Um, lots and lots of red. Not good for us. Good for the uh, VHF auroral guys, but not so good for HF um, DX at all. All right, at this point, I know you want to go and um, get your pr uh, prizes. So, as I said, the links to s some of the stuff I spoke about here is at g0kya.blogspot.co.uk. Just Google G0KYA and that comes up. Also, I want to remind you that we have two presentations for clubs, which are video presentations, one on HF, um, which is about 25 minutes, and one on VHF, I think it's about 35, 40 minutes, that um, can be downloaded, but they're strictly for use for clubs. You've got a handout as well that's got background information for you, and what we do is we offer this to clubs. Um, you make an appointment with us, we give you a link to download it, and what we say is you can show it at your club, and then you can have a Skype uh, Q&A session afterwards um, with somebody from Propagation Studies Committee, and that works quite well for clubs. Because we found that people are saying, oh, can you come and give us a talk? Where are you? Orkney Islands. Yeah, okay, uh, not so good. But the HF1 has been used about uh, 85, 90 times now. The VHF1 about 40. And we're going to put something in Radcom just to remind people again. But it's a very, very good way um, of having a presentation in the club, completely free of charge. Um, and if you want, you don't have to have the Skype Q&A, but if you want the Skype Q&A after the thing, that makes a really good evening um, entertainment, as they say. Uh, any queries, psc.chairman, that's me, at rsgb.org.uk, and uh, there we go. So at this point, any questions other than you want to go and win a radio at this gentleman there? There you go.